Hi everybody, um, my name is Louise Jupp. I'm the editor of Drone Professional One, which came out at the beginning of this year. It is a book um, written by 16 professional experts in the drone industry, covering their best thinking on drone technology, all the applications of drones in professional contexts, um, their best practice, and some various discussions of case studies. Um, I've got one of those authors with me here today. It's Graham Dyer. Um, who wrote about an African drone experience, and it was really very interesting. But welcome, Graham. Hi there. Hi, Louise. Hi, everybody. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, thanks for joining me today. Um, can I ask you the sort of first primary question? I mean, uh, sort of, what, what's your role in the industry? How did you How did you get involved? Well, in this particular industry, the the, the anti poaching industry that I was involved in, um, I had always been involved in um, uh, model airplanes, radio control model airplanes. Uh, well, aircraft in particular, but also boats, cars, anything radio control uh, was, was of, of great interest to me. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and then I started getting into the idea of putting a camera onto the, onto the plane or the drone, uh, before it was a drone really. So put the camera on the plane, um, and then I wanted to uh, do something which I call first person view, which is the wearing a headset or looking at a screen and flying the airplane with a camera inside the plane as, as if you're inside the plane. And I managed to find myself cameras and transmitters and headsets and so on. And the first time I did that, I had a little experience where I got lost. Um, the plane flew off in the direction I didn't know it was going or I didn't realize it was going in. And thankfully I had a friend with me who was able to keep an eye on the plane. But when I realized that something was wrong and I was, I was lost, I was unable to see where I was from the air, uh, took the goggles off and uh, I thought the plane was sort of up ahead of me. Meanwhile, it was behind me flying away. And oh, right. uh, we, were able to, we were able to bring the plane back before it got lost. And that little experience sort of triggered an idea that, that couldn't I get an autopilot, some, some, something to, to take over control if I was lost or something was wrong with the airplane or something was, you know, maybe you lose signal um, of the thing and the, and the autopilot could then fly the plane back to me. So I started investigating in um, autopilots, ended up uh, using one of the um, main autopilots that we used for the anti-poaching. Uh, got very involved in that, including um, some of the development and testing and um, uh, suggestions and all kinds of things for the for the software, um, adding features and so on. Um, and that evolved to the point that we uh, started with with a drone properly. So this is now a drone that could autonomously fly back to where it came from, uh, an aeroplane, and then um, a multi rotors obviously were being developed at the same time um, and that looked like fun and that was a, a it was a vertical takeoff um, so no, no need to throw the airplane um, to get it going so the multi-rotors I put then put the camera put put the autopilot into the multi-rotor and then um, put the camera into the multi-rotor as well and then flew around with the autopilot and that was my sort of introduction and um, sort of start with drones um, and having um, got so intensively into uh, the RG pilots uh, Pixhawk uh, um, ecosystem uh, of drones um, I, I knew it backwards I knew it forwards backwards you know all the little parameters and everything and how to make the drone fly properly and so on especially in those early years where it was very rough and things didn't mm. always work very well uh, you know a couple of times I had drones just fly away by themselves and then you had to sort of try and figure out what happened and why it did that and um, that then resulted in me um, uh, getting into the anti-poaching story where a company who was starting to develop an anti-poaching drone uh, approached me and said would I like to come on as, uh, as their first employee and uh, we would then develop a drone and that's basically where the whole thing started. Okay, uh, that's, yeah. that's really interesting, especially the, the sort of actually having a play with the, with the sort of remote control and designing your own stuff. There. I, I haven't done that myself, 
that sounds kind of fun or that sounds a bit scary on occasions <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so, well it, it's 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 great if it works okay but if if, yeah. if something goes wrong um i had i had one drone fly away and um it, it literally was within an arm's reach of where i was and it started to fly away and mm. there was no control it just something the 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 the, the um, software froze and there was something wrong and the drone flew away and had a, a, a very thorny tree not been in its way it would have flown off and, and disappeared completely and i didn't have a camera on it at the time but i put my mobile phone onto the onto the drone and so oh. it was flying away with my mobile phone on it <laughs> um and yes it was uh, it, it very nearly flew away thank you if it wasn't for the knob thorn tree that it flew into um, yeah. But then I couldn't get it. It was at the top of the tree, so it was a big job to try get the the drone out of the tree. Um, but yes, that was one of the things where you get you get a really nerve wracking situation where you see a lot of money flying away and you can do nothing about it. Absolutely! Oh crumbs! Oh yeah! That, oh classic! Um, I should have actually said when I introduced you just now, you're in a very enviable position of being in a in a in a game reserve. Hey. Yes, yes, I'm uh, I'm locked down uh, in a, a game reserve called Dinner King. Uh, mm -hmm. We've a small property here, and uh, yes, we've got uh, about eighteen thousand hectares of land around us of game reserve, Big Five. Uh, had the lions come past the waterhole here two nights ago. Um, wildebeest and zebra here this morning. Ostriches have been coming past. So there's yeah, a cheetah as well walked past the other day. Um, so yes, wow. nice, nice to be nice to be locked down in a in a in a, a really good environment. Absolutely, I'll keep looking on behind your right shoulder there to see if everything anything's going to walk into view. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, no, no I don't right. think so. Nothing at the moment there. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, if I squeak, I'll, I've seen something. <laughs> I'll, I'll shout if I see anything more coming. There were there were some wildebeest and zebras here this morning that were walking just outside uh, the property here. So uh, they came and drank in, uh, at the water hole. Okay, oh, wonderful. I mean, obviously anti-poaching is, is very important to you um, as much because I mean, what a place to be living in. But um, I thought your chapter was fascinating, you know, the, an African drone experience. And you sort of explained your, your experience trying to or using drones for, for anti-poaching. And I thought you came up with some really um, key points. I mean, do, can you sort of explain what it was that you covered in your chapter? Yes, so um, uh, the main thing of the chapter was, was just to explain some of the uh, logistics and difficulties that we encountered um, setting up one of the first, or in fact probably the first uh, uh, anti-poaching drone operation in the Kruger National Park. So it was, we were the first company to get permission to go into the Kruger Park and fly um, unhindered um without any regulations at that stage um and to actually do try to to detect poachers mm. so there were various things and and I, I towards the end of the article i, I mentioned the, the three factors that um make up a, a successful anti-poaching one of course is the detection and the beginning of the article, I spoke a little bit about um, what we had to do to try and find these poachers. So we had an anti-poaching drone. We had a couple of them. Um, we had to uh, design and fix and repair, uh, sometimes on the fly. Um, you know, we had a 3D printer in our vehicle. We were printing sometimes parts when the drone was actually flying so that when it got back, we could replace a part that had cracked or had broken or was its design wasn't 100%. Um, and then the various other things that, you know, we encountered while doing the anti-poaching. So, you know, insects, animals, um, trying to sleep the, the morning after the drone operation the whole night and having, you know, animals come through camp and, and jump around on your, on your uh, accommodation and, and so on and break yeah. things inside camp. So, um, so that that was just some of the the little interesting things that we encountered and so on uh, doing the anti poaching, and then um, the next point of the of the three points. So the first one was the detection. The next point was the was the um, retention. 
And retention refers to once you found the poacher, once you have him in sight, and we're talking about a, a poacher who's uh, in groups of three people usually in that area the, with the rhino poaching, and they were in enormous tracts of land. We're talking thousands and thousands of acres of land, hectares of land. Um, so once you've found them, and, and finding them was extremely difficult. It was it was a, a monumental task to actually track down three people walking in two and a half thousand hectares of land, which was a typical um, block of land that we used to cover during the drone operation. Once you found him, or him the, the, the poachers, um, the next thing was then to keep eyes on the perpetrator, as they might say. Um, so you've got to retain the view. You've got to hold that, 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 that poacher or the poachers. And you can't physically hold them. So the only way is to keep your eyes on them, keep the camera on them. And if that poacher starts to run through thick vegetation or just hides under a tree, um, a thermal camera cannot see under a tree uh, because it blocks the heat light that, that the, the thermal camera is seeing. And the cameras are not very high resolution. So once you go under a tree or even under relatively thin leaf cover, uh, a person can actually hide from a thermal camera relatively easy. There's not, um, uh, you know, there are other ways, things like um, LIDAR and, and things like that, which can see under the tree and see what's under the tree. But they require very big computers on um, online processing or on board processing sometimes, which involves very fast computing power. Um, so even to retain the poacher, in other words, just keep an eye on him, once he's been found is, is, is enormous task. It's really, really difficult. And you need to do that for a lengthy period of time. You might need to do it for an hour or mm. two until you can get a team of, of rangers um, to come and apprehend the poacher. And that's the third and possibly the most difficult part of, of, of everything because you still have to get someone there to put the handcuffs on the poacher to actually go and catch him and hold him, hold him, you know, retain, mm. uh, uh, apprehend him. Um, because those poachers, they, they don't just sit there and lie and, and, you know, stand around and wait for a team to come and catch them. They will run and they can run far and fast. Um, and we've, you know, we, we saw it where we tried to guide uh, a, um, a ranger into uh, an, uh, an object that we thought were, were some poachers in KwaZulu Natal. And we'd found these poachers the one night, or what we thought were poachers. They were something in the bushes that was moving around in, in fairly thick vegetation. And the, the guy, um, we were, had a cell phone and we were talking to him and we were trying to guide him in to this point where we could see this, this object moving around in the bushes. And it, it took him at least half an hour to drive there. And he wasn't far away. He was a kilometer off the, off the road. It took him half an hour to drive there at night through the bush, um, through holes, uh, logs, uh, gullies, you know, all kinds of things. And once we got him, to the position, um, he was able to then, with the spotlight, go and have a look. And it turned out there was some some bush pigs um, <laughs> that were in these bushes, basically, you know, foraging around. Um, mm. But had it been a poacher, the poacher wouldn't have hung around. He would have oh. tried to get away from that area as as quick as possible. The bush pigs weren't too concerned about the vehicle; they were, they were fairly used to in that area. Um, but um, the, the poacher would hang, wouldn't hang around. He'd be running. And mm. yes, you can f try and follow him, try and retain view of him. But it's, it's, it just, it's an incredibly difficult thing. One is the retention. And then second, even more difficult, is, is the actual apprehension. They mm. don't stand still. So once you've yeah. found him, he's not going to stay there, wait for you. He's going to run and he's going to run and he's going to run. Um, oh. and to follow him while he's running is also very hard. Um, and the only way you can do really to follow him 
and, and to apprehend him is, for example, which they're doing with some of the dog um, teams, the, the, the canine units in the Kruger Park, where they chase the poacher and the poacher goes up a tree because he doesn't want to get bitten by the dogs. And once he's up the tree, he can't run anymore. So he's then caught. He's, he's essentially caught. Mm. And yes, you potentially could do that. But then you've got people and dogs who are having to run around at night when there are lion, hyena, leopard, um, buffaloes, rhinos, elephants in the same, potentially in the same area that you could run into. And that is life threatening both to the, 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 the rangers and to the dogs. Um, you know, a leopard will, will kill a dog, a lion, if a, um, will run, if a uh, anti poaching dog runs into a group of lion, the lions will kill the dog. There's mm. potentially the same with a person. Um, you know, if you're running and you're chasing a poacher and you inadvertently run into a pride of lions, uh, they might not take so kindly to have uh, you running through them through their midst. So um, yes, and then the people don't, you know, the, the the they don't really want to do that either. Although they've got the incentive to catch the person, the, the poacher, the poacher's got an incentive to get away because then he escapes. He doesn't get caught. He doesn't go to jail. He doesn't have to do a court case. Um, and if he's got a horn with him, then he may get the money for the horn. So there's a huge mm. incentive not to get caught for the for the ranger who's doing the catching, um, he's got a, a salary which is relatively minor, a relatively small salary uh, compared to what the poacher would be getting for the horn. Um, and he's got his safety and his family to think of. He doesn't want to run into a pride of lions, um, you know, potentially at night while, while chasing a, a poacher. Um, no, yes, the rhinos, are, the rhinos are very important and that's what mm. he's trying to preserve. Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, that's what I found fascinating about your, your story. And I mean, even the bit right at the beginning when you explain when you had to go and collect, you know, when your drone, um, I think it was a software problem and it, and it hit a tree somewhere, you lost signal with it and you eventually did find it. But you had to go and get someone to help you find it. And, and yeah, the story you had to, we had of to go and walk around walk. in the dark. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, the anti poaching is not a daytime thing. You've got, you know, all these sort of factors that really make it quite difficult for you. Absolutely. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. What was the flying time of, of the uh, of the drone? Because it was a fixed wing. Hey. It was a fixed wing. So it was a it was a fixed wing um, aircraft uh, airplane. Mm -hmm. um, it had a two point four meter um, six or seven or seven or eight foot wingspan, um, mm -hmm. and our duration was was two hours. Just over two hours was our our maximum duration, okay. which was a mm -hmm. decent amount of time a uh, flying speed at that stage was about 45 47 kilometers an hour um, mm -hmm. and when we first uh, met with one, one of the rangers in the Kruger Park who was heavily involved in the in the, um, in, in the anti-poaching um, he mentioned uh, something to us which stuck in my mind at the time and he said if we're going to do a drone we need something to fly low and slow mm -hmm. Um, oh, right. There's been yeah. other drones that up to that point um, flown by other companies in the Kruger Park that were flying at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 feet above the ground um, and flying at 100 knots. Um, mm. And again, they saw nothing. They had no encounters with poachers whatsoever. But you're flying so high and so fast that, you, yes, you cover a lot of ground, but you're just not being able to see clearly on the ground. So he said low and slow. And, oh. and that's what we envisaged with our drone. We, we got a drone to fly, uh, as I said, 45 kilometers an hour uh, for a two hour period. And we were generally flying at between 200 and 300 feet above the ground. Um, and that was actually a good height because uh, any higher and your view on the ground was, uh, was wider, uh, but oh. less clear. And any lower, your view on the ground was narrower, uh, but obviously sharper, sharper, clear, better resolution. Um, oh. So between 200 and 300 feet was was about right, and and that's what we flew most of our, our operations at. And and how we, um, you know, you sort of also mentioned some of the sort of environmental conditions that you put up with. I mean, like the, the temperatures and then the howling winds and things like that. It must have presented some interesting difficulties uh, to maintain a form of aerial presence as well you know, for yes absolutely um we, we had to fly with the weather we we were frequently interrupted by thunderstorms or we mm. had to wait until the thunderstorm finished uh and then you know took off um 
basically with a thunderstorm having just passed the grass all wet and so on and then and, and went and did our patrols that way. Um, the temperatures, uh, I remember very clearly one night um, we were flying along the La Bombo, um uh, mountains in the central part of the Kruger Park near Olifant's camp and um, or just south of Olifant's camp and there'd been po uh, uh, poaching activity in that area um, so um, there's lots of stories you can tell of, of these things mm. but one of this particular operation where where there was actually a gunshot one night and so we had sent the drone in to go and try to find the origin of the gunshot um, one of the one of the rangers picket posts had reported hearing the gunshot, given us a more uh, direction where the, where it was, and and mm -hmm. we had the drone up already, but in a different area, so we had to bring the drone back very quickly, land the drone, put a new battery in, uh, get it launched back up into the air as quick as possible, and then uh, shoot off to the area which is about seven kilometres away, uh, where the gunshot had been heard, and then we patrolled that area looking for the for the for what it what had made the gunshot um mm. we, ne we never did see anyone there but 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 that was the reason for us being in that area and this was at 11 o'clock at night um and i think we took it off, took off at about quarter past 11 and we then flew another a two-hour mission and the temperature when we took off um we had a little external thermometer on the on the operating vehicle and the temperature was 37 celsius which is the same as a, as a, as a human's body temperature. So mm. everything around us, the ground, the rocks, um, the, the tree stumps, the, the tree stems, which tend to absorb sunlight and heat during the day, and then they radiate that heat during the night. Um, so everything, including all the animals in the area, were at that temperature because your air temperature was 37 degrees Celsius. And that may, may have been a factor to a, to us not actually seeing a poacher that night. Um, we could see the hippopotamus that had come out of the water because his skin was covered with water and the evaporation caused his skin to go very cold. Um, mm. So we're flying along and, and we're seeing all these <coughs> um, warm thermal signatures of, of animals and rocks and things. And all of a sudden here's a, about five really, really cold ones. And at first, yes. from a distance, we didn't know why on earth these things were cold um, because everything around us was hot. It was hot where we were. And as we got closer, we could see it was actually wet hippopotami that, um, <laughs> that actually had, you know, their bodies were cooled by the, by the evaporating water. But yes, it's it really, really hard. You, you, you've got to find a, a person uh, wearing clothes. So the clothes actually uh, mask some of the heat um uh, with a thermal camera and and you've got to find them when the ambient temperature is the same temperature as the person's skin um so mm. really really hard um and difficult flying conditions we you know we could um we had an air condition in the vehicle but that would make a noise um and it would flatten the batteries of the vehicle so we then had to f either just open the doors but then the mosquitoes came in and the moths came in and they used to you know, you know, they have 20 or 30 moths flying around your screen while you're trying to watch it, while you're trying to control the drone um, mm. and the mosquitoes biting you and so on. So, yeah, I know really, really difficult uh, conditions for, for the operators in those conditions, trying your best at the time to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to try and change or make a, have an effect on, on, on the poaching or the terrible anti-poaching or poaching situation that it was then and and is still now it's, it, it, a lot of it mm. hasn't gone away i mean um what, what do you think the solution is though i mean do you think drones of any type can have a, a role to play um more so in the future perhaps i mean because you do make it really clear in your article that really at the end of the day the dog teams had far more success than you now whether that was because you chased away the the the, the poachers anyway because they heard you coming or whether it's just because you couldn't see them for the reasons you just said. But yes. what do you think? Is there a, is there a role for drones in anti-poaching? As, as far as apprehending poachers, and, 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 and that's really, there's really two things you would like to. One is to, is to scare poachers away. In other words, mm -hmm. make it difficult for them to come into an area so, so they actually don't want to come there. So just limiting the, the, the number of poachers that come into an area. So that's one way where a drone potentially could help. 
Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that. But the other one is, is the apprehension. So hmm. a drone can't apprehend a poacher by itself. Um, in an ideal world with, with all the technology, some of it perhaps even you know, un, undeveloped at this point, you could have uh, 100 drones or 1,000 drones, small ones that could uh, go out, look for poachers by themselves with you know, 4K, 8K cameras, with, with very expensive um, supercomputers on board, doing their algorithms and trying to find, their po uh, find the poacher. When the battery goes flat or is about to go flat, the drone returns, uh, recharges itself, lands on a, on a thing, recharges itself, and another one goes out in its place um, so that you've got this constant presence. And, and you need, let's say, a thousand drones would be the, the, you know, I'm talking in a completely ideal world. And mm. then when the, when the poacher then is found, um, you could have, you know, 10 drones that would follow that one poacher. Or one of the drones would be armed with a tranquilizer dart and he would dart the poacher. And then, then you can put the cuffs on the drone, uh, cuffs on the mm. poacher. But mm. until that is a reality, the drone is not going to actually catch the poacher. The drone can't do the apprehension itself. It's the people who have to mm. do the apprehension. And one of the, I mean, the main thing that we worked on was the detection. So we spent many, many hours and months and years and eventually trying to do the detection, trying to actually see the poacher. And that is difficult. It is not an easy task. Then you've got the retention. So once you've found him, you've got to hold on to that poacher. In other words, you've got to keep the eyes on him. That is extremely difficult as well. And then the last thing is that apprehension. You've got to get um, another team of men and women in some cases as well, because there are women anti-poaching uh, teams around, into that area quietly and somehow put the cuffs onto that person who's not going to hang around. So mm -hmm. that is what is the sort of um, conventional thought process behind how you catch the poacher. So the drone does the detection, also does the retention. It cannot do the apprehension. So you've got to get someone in there, a person in there to do the actual apprehension. Yeah. Coming back to the first thing um, that I mentioned there was, was uh, deterrence. And the one area, we, we actually flew one area around um, Pretoria Scorp and south of Pretoria Scorp in the Kruger National Park. Um, and we flew that area for about two months. Now, the month before we arrived, uh, there were nine rhinos shot in that area. Nine rhinos poached and the horns removed. But towards the end of the previous month, um, one of the poachers had, or the, that group of poachers, had been involved in a, um, a skirmish with some of the rangers. And some shots were fired and one of the poachers was shot dead. One was, was injured and captured. And the other one ran away. The other one got away. So two of the three poachers were incapacitated one one shot dead the other one uh, wounded and the rifle was was recovered and the ammunition was recovered now ammunition is also difficult to get hold of and the rifles are very difficult to get hold of they have to pay money to get hold of those those things including the ammunition which you just can't go to a store and buy it has to be stolen from somewhere and mm. um so the month we arrived Nine rhinos had been poached the previous month and we started flying actively every single night we were out, um, weather dependent and um, conditions dependent and so on. And we tried all kinds of things. We tried um, going with the drones lights on near the villages so that we could be seen by the poachers or mm -hmm. anyone in the village who could pass a message onto the poacher and said, hold on, there's some weird light type aircraft flying around in, in over the park. Um, we flew lights off surreptitiously, uh, covertly, um, and we did our patrols up and down. We flew in the early afternoon, we flew at night, we flew at the middle of the night, we flew at the early hours of the morning, etc., etc. And for that month, there were no further uh, rhinos poached. Now, whether it comes to our um, presence there, and, and we didn't advertise to anyone, not even our bosses knew where we were flying. 
not even mm. the rangers in the park. They knew a general area, but the rangers didn't know specifically where we were flying. Um, and sometimes we went to the north, and sometimes we went to the south, and sometimes we went to the east. So there was no uh, pattern that we that we that we did. Um, so only us, only the two people involved uh, in in the actual flying knew where we were flying these anti-poaching missions and uh, whether we actually affected that whether we were able to cause some deterrence effect uh, may well have been they may well have known may uh, you know the um, the poachers may well have heard via the grapevine that something was in the area but because they are outside the park and there are roads outside the park it wasn't hard for them to move their operation 50 or 100 kilometers to the north and and poach that side um so yeah. we spent two months in that area we had no rhinos poached in the area it may have been our deterrence it may have been the deterrence our presence there it may also be in the fact that the team the poaching group one was dead one was injured another one ran away um, so they needed to regroup. They needed to find a new rifle. They needed to get more ammunition. They needed to find another two people uh, ready to risk their lives to go into the park. Um, and they may take one or two months to regroup and, and, and do that. So we can't say for sure that we had some deterrence effect. We like to think so, but can't claim um, you know, a success there because it wouldn't take long before that poacher would be regrouped get a rifle again, more ammunition, and then they would go into that area again. And you've got to stay there as an anti-poaching team for, you know, six months to have a, mm. a real um, uh, effect on, on deterring the poacher. And as I say, then he just moves. He moves. If he doesn't go into the Kruger Park, he goes down to KwaZulu Natal where there's also rhinos there, and he goes and poaches there for six months. Um, so you spend all this effort trying to catch them in that area. Meanwhile, they just go somewhere else and start poaching. Um, so very, yes. very difficult uh, situation. Yes, it must have been quite difficult for, for, for you also, you know, in the sense of, you know, it would be nice to have, um, I'm just curious if it was disappointing for you that, that um, it wasn't quite as, um, it didn't quite solve the problem. You know, like you say, you're moving the problem somewhere else temporarily that, that you were unable yeah. to actually apprehend. That uh, Absolutely, somewhere. it um, mm. it actually it actually offends uh, you know. Um, I've I've always I worked in a game lodge for for many years. I spent twenty two years in and out of game lodges, um, working as a as a safari guide, and wildlife and and uh, you know animals and and rhinos in particular are, are a passion of mine. Mm. Um, so to 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 put your hearts and souls into that kind of operation, um, where you have no measurable success. You almost get to the point, in fact, you do get to the point where you go out the next day um, or the next night and you're going to do this operation and you know, you're all fired up again and you say, yes, tonight we're going to find something and you find nothing. And the next night mm -hmm. the same and the next night the same and the next night the same. And when you've done that for two months, um, there's very little, you get very little, you're very, very demotivated. You lose all hope that you're actually having an effect. Um, and it yeah. affects your morale of the group, uh, the guys that you're with. And even you go and leave um, and you get a break from the whole thing and you come back and, you, and you, you, you start the whole process again. And you ask the guys that have been, you know, you've been on two weeks leave. You ask the guys, you know, have you had any success? Nothing. They said they've flown mm. solidly for two weeks while you've been away and nothing. They haven't seen a single, a single person. And, we were, you know, we used to get those reports, which I, I, I put in the article as well, um, of uh, a list of, of incidences of what yeah. happened. And I mean, that is th that little bit that I put in there is very raw because it's it's the poaching statistics that that just came in every single day. And every day there was rhinos poached, and every day oh. we were flying and we were having no success. We were not seeing a single poacher. Um, and yet there were all these statistics, all these carcasses that were being found, um, not necessarily specifically in our area, but it was felt that rather us stay in one area 
then they move around too much. And, and eventually we did. We did. We, we just stayed in the one area for a long period of time. Um, and then we, were, then we started to chop and change. We've got two weeks one place, two weeks the next place to see if we could have a effect and, and to see if we could actually find, um, you know, find a poacher. And we saw very few poachers. Uh, you know, oh. our, I think we had f- three or four teams eventually. And, and um, a, a, co- a good friend of mine, a colleague, um, he, they saw poachers uh, the one night. They found them and they were re- retaining them. And he mm-hmm. phoned the, the ranger at three o'clock in the morning and said, I can see this poacher, uh, you know, come and catch him. And that's when the whole idea of, of the apprehension hit home because he had to get his staff out of bed. They had to be promised overtime. They had to get all the equipment ready. They had to drive closer with the vehicle. They had to get out the car two kilometers away, walk through the bush at night, all the time while the drone pilot is still trying to keep an eye on the, on, on the actual uh, poacher. And uh-huh. eventually the, the, the ranger said, we, we'll follow up in the morning we're just not going to be able to go. He says he can't offer his staff overtime because they've, you know, let's say they, I can't remember what it was, but maybe they'd worked, you know, six days overtime or seven days overtime already. And now he didn't have the budget to offer them the overtime um, oh. because they'd worked the whole day. Um, now they've got to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go chase, you know, try and chase the poacher. Um, and, and that's when it's really struck home to me that yes, after, one and a half, this is after one and a half years of flying, we found a poacher and we could retain him for a time as long as, because they were on a fresh battery. So we had an hour's left of battery to, to follow that poacher. And he happened to be in this poacher, well, these poachers happened to be in a riverbed, um, but with very thick vegetation on both sides of the riverbed. And when the battery started to go flat, my, my friend had to come back put a new battery and then go back and try to find the poacher. And the poacher was gone. And the yes. bush is so thick on either side of the riverbed, there was no chance. And that's just when it sort of struck home that yes, um, you know, difficult, the um, uh, detection, but the retention and the apprehension is, is the really hard part. But absolutely, um, it, it uh, destroyed our morale. Uh, having f- flying for so many months and, 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 and not having a single to success, uh, certainly initially to, um, to even write home about. Mm. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because, it, yeah, it, yes, I, I can't imagine how you must have felt. Um, but, um, yeah, you, you sort of wonder, you know, you could say, well, maybe you need a fleet of these all flying, but what's the cost? Um, and can yes. that sort of thing be afforded? You know, that, that sort of pushes it out of um, the availability of, of parks, perhaps, as well. It's, um, it's too difficult, perhaps, anyway, to have a, a drone-supported anti-poaching unit, perhaps. I'm not sure. Yes, I think, uh, look, in, in, in smaller game reserves, there, there, is some, um, there is potentially some benefit. So some deterrence factor. Oh. You know, if, you, um, if the poachers know Maybe they, don't, maybe they don't know what the capability of the drone is, but they know there's a drone. Oh. And whether you, you know, maybe if, if one poacher got caught by a drone, the word would get out that the drones would, could be catching poachers. And that may have some deterrence effect. So you may fly for six months and not see anyone, but you may deter some of the poachers from coming in because they know there's a drone team around and there's no that there's eyes in the sky um you know looking over the area so you may have some deterrent effect there in a smaller reserve um of maybe a few thousand hectares you may have more luck um the we we had a a one area that was a relatively small area um and we were only flying uh, about 500 hectares in in one block and it was on a fence that had an alarm on the fence. So if someone triggered the alarm on the fence, we would, we'd be sleeping and um, the alarm would go off. We'd wake up, the drone was ready. We'd run to the vehicle, launch the drone, and we got the drone over the area where the alarm was within about eight minutes. Um, okay. But in eight minutes, the, the poacher could walk into the reserve or out of the reserve, if he, if he was escaping, if he was getting out with a horn, 
or coming in with oh. a rifle. And we had to oh. make a decision. Do we go look outside or do we go look inside? Most of the time we tried to catch the poachers coming in. So we would go and we would go one kilometer. But in eight minutes, you can actually walk quite far. And if you're trotting, you can, you can go a distance. Um, and, and even all of that, we never found a, a poacher. And they were coming in. Oh. Um, so in smaller reserves, yes, you could also, and, and based on intelligence and based on alarm systems where you, where a fence would be triggered or a, a beam would be triggered by um, a person crossing the, the fence and then you can get the drone in, in, in place. Um, but you still have this difficulty of the actual um, apprehension because oh. that poacher doesn't just stand still. Um, you've got to, chase him up a tree you've got to somehow yeah. trap him hold him yeah um you know lasso him and and you know drones can't don't carry lassoes so uh <laughs> it's it's not uh, it's not it's not an easy thing it really isn't an easy thing and, and i think um a lot of people have the um you know the idea that technology will overcome everything um mm. especially with the drones where you can have the best technology but that also costs lots of money and um, the, the, the conservation organizations are often run, running on a, on a, on a shoestring uh, budget. Yeah. They, they really, you know, they don't have a lot of money. They need boots. They need salaries. They need food for their staff. Um, they need flashlights. They need, um, you know, clothes, things like that, yeah. warm jackets and jerseys at night in winter when it's very cold. Um, and then they need the money for that. And yes, there's money for some of the drone stuff, but those come from donors, donor organizations, and they are wonderful donor organizations that have been donating money to this. But once you start having to develop really good technology, you have to get to the point where you are, you know, you're talking very expensive drones and drones that may be fragile, mo drones that, that are, whose operating conditions might be, quite specific if they can't operate if it's if there's a lot of humidity or if it's drizzling or um and the, mm. the poachers are quite happy to walk around when it's drizzling um and the drone cannot fly most drones cannot fly at night certainly the ones that that uh, that have any kind of duration a two-hour duration most of the commercial drones in the market nowadays you know 30 40 minutes at most for the for the multi-rotors and then the vtols now are having an hour to two hours of of duration um, but a lot of those are not weatherproof. Weatherproof adds weight and adds complexity and adds expense um, to, to, to make them weatherproof. Um, so, yes, not, not easy if, it's, if you get any kind of inclement weather. Mm, okay. But, but was there any positive from the side of, you know, maybe because you were out there that, that, that humans could, could uh, you were saving, well, not saving, I don't know if that's quite, there was a safety element that you were adding because you were out there rather than rangers, if you know what I mean. Was there some form of pay, pay, a positive payoff, for, apart from maybe some yes. deterrence? Also I, by I you so. being there instead of humans? Hmm. Yes, I think so. Uh, there was, um, amongst the rangers that we had contact with, um, it was almost a sort of 50-50 split about, uh, by the guys, or actually sometimes it was more of a 30-70 split, 30 being the guys who were accepting of the, of the concept and mm -hmm. would, who would work with us. So there were some of the rangers who were willing to take the chance, willing to, to put their manpower uh, or make their manpower available to us if we found a poacher. Um, and there were a lot of the rangers who, I think, although they didn't understand the drone perhaps, but a lot of them were very skeptical as to whether this worked. And, and maybe initially when we went in, I was a little bit surprised by the skepticism. Um, mm -hmm. But having done it, I understand the skepticism now because they know the conditions. They know those poachers, how those poachers operate and how they can vanish into thin air. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've had um, poachers uh, climb down um, ant bear, aardvark burrows uh, or warthog burrows where the poacher goes into a warthog burrow to escape detection. So if, if a drone's flying around and he goes down a warthog burrow, you're not going to do anything. You can't catch him. Um, <laughs> you know, they hide in tree stumps. They hide, they, they smear themselves with 
with elephant dung to try um, <laughs> put off the scent of the dogs. Um, so they, they cover themselves in, in, in elephant dung um, mm. to, 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 to offset this, you know, this, the, the smell. Um, so there was that skepticism from a lot of them. And, and I think they understood the true difficulties of finding someone, um, you know, in the bush. And mm. um, the other guys were, were, you know, quite keen. One of the ideas that was put forward was, for example, that when a team was walking at night, could we not send the drone ahead of them to look for any dangerous animals? Because they walking mm. in the dark, they didn't necessarily have night vision equipment because that night vision equipment is extremely expensive and, and rare. Um, and, and almost no one had, in, had that in the Kruger Park. So could we not fly the drone ahead? And that was something we did. We did some tests with that where we would fly the drone ahead of the, po of, of the ranger. We would look for the rhinos, the, the buffaloes, the elephants and the lions in their pathway. And after going a kilometer ahead of them, uh, we could come back and say, there's nothing ahead of you. If you can go ahead, that area is safe. So that was mm -hmm. one of the uses, but we still weren't apprehending poachers with the drones at that, you know, okay. in that sort of kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Which is what you wanted to really do. Yeah. Yes, okay. which is what we wanted to really do. So I think mm. deterrence, yes, I think you could have it, especially in a small reserve. Um, and if you can build up some hype about the drones, in other words, if a poacher got caught by a drone, he would go to jail, he would tell all his jail mates that the drone caught me. And mm. then you, you, you know, you start the, 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 the rumor, you start the, um, the propaganda of the drone. Um, yes. But you've got to get the drone to catch that person the first time around. Um, so that mm. is, and that's where it is difficult. Okay. No, interesting. No, well, as I said, I think you're, you, it's a great story in there and it, it really does give a good presentation on the reality versus, versus the potential or the hype in some cases that uh, it really does show that sometimes they're not going to be the silver bullet to, to uh, solve everything. Um, so it's a great story in that regard. Um, cool. Um, I was going to just quickly ask you, um, uh, you're still, you're, you're now sort of working um, with the, um, the blood service, the South African blood service. Um, yes, South that African National, again, National Blood Service. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm busy working with them. Uh, we're going to, we're working on a, a blood delivery project. So mm. the idea is that we would, um, from, a, from a blood bank, and I think it's about 84, 80 of them in South Africa, um, so from a blood bank to a hospital or a clinic. And currently, the, uh, the, we're not talking about general day-to-day -day blood because that is handled by a, a career service um, or, a, or a, the local um, the, the sand, the blood service's own uh, fleet and vehicle transportation and so on. Um, so that is a general um, service that they supply blood to hospitals, for example but sometimes they need emergency blood. And this is where the blood service would, um, would, would come into play and blood deliveries would come into play. So what the idea is that someone needs blood. So for example, an accident victim or a, a postpartum hemorrhaging in childbirth um, mm -hmm. where someone is bleeding out and they need blood immediately. And some of the smaller clinics may not have blood on stock. So the idea is that we would, um, they would put send an order to the, um, to the blood bank, which, which they do, but obviously then uh, it has to go through all the processes and they have to get a vehicle and the blood then has to be driven from the blood bank to the hospital or clinic. And in some cases it may be 10 kilometers away, but in some cases it's 100 kilometers away. And in some cases 100 kilometers can be a four hour drive um, depending on the road conditions and some, if it's raining or if there's you know, bad conditions and things, it's even further or longer. It takes longer in time. So if we had a drone um, and we've got a drone flying at, uh, let's say, 100 kilometers an hour, we could have the blood there in an hour instead of four hours. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the idea. So the idea is then to send emergency blood in the drone, send it to the clinic, the nurse or the doctor receives the blood, can give it to the patient, 
In the meantime, the drone will wait at the, the clinic um, for a blood sample. The sample will then be placed into the drone. The drone takes off vertically, returns back to um, the blood bank. The blood is then cross-matched so that we get the blood uh, type of the patient and additional units of blood can then be sent with the same drone or with another drone uh, back to the clinic uh, in case they need more or in usual case they, they have just have some sort of standby if they need, uh, you know, if they need the blood then. So the whole idea was this two-way logistics. One is to deliver the blood, emergency blood. Two, bring the sample back, have it cross-matched and send the patient's uh, type matched blood to them. Um, and, and specifically for the emergency blood. So that is what we're busy with at the moment. Uh, we're going, um, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of regulatory hurdles that we have to, to jump through or jump over. Um, so one of the big problems that we're having is, problems we're encountering is that we have to uh, apply, for example, to the um, ICASA, the Communications Authority in South Africa. We apply for uh, a type approval we apply for our radio licenses, and it, it takes a long time. Um, one of the licenses, we, we've been waiting for four months for, for it from them. So that is one of the, 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 the issues we face. And then we have to go through the uh, aviation um, hurdles as well. So through our Civil Aviation Authority, we have to um, do all the processes. We have to write an, a complete ops manual. We have to assign... Um, uh, jobs to various people within the organization, a, a tremendous amount, completely unnecessary hurdles that some of them that we have to jump through, jump over, um, to get our license to actually do, um, to do drone deliveries, to do blood deliveries. And these are, you know, life-saving deliveries that we want to do. We're not, we're not uh, a gung-ho company that, you know, is going to risk life and limb uh, we want to go through the processes. We want to make sure we're safe. We want to make sure that the airspace is safe. Um, and one of the things that we've suggested is to give us um, segregated airspace. So between the, the, the blood bank and the clinic, give us that little block of land, that little bit of airspace, um, and it mm. may be 500 meters wide by 500 meters high, um, but give us that airspace so that that airspace is, us, is for the drone exclusive use so that there's no risk of running to another aircraft at that point. Um, and making sure that that um, segregated airspace is then known to the general aviation um, so that we can use it for, for, for the blood saving uh, deliveries, blood deliveries. Mm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting thought about the segre segregated airspace. Yeah, sort of, um, I like that idea. But, uh, yeah, and I, I can imagine it can be, it's a bit of a, um, bit of a, steep hill you're climbing up at the moment <laughs> yes yes we'll, 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 we'll get there as i say yeah. uh you know we've, we've got to go through the process we've got to make first of all, we've got to make sure our our drones are all uh, uh, uh comply with all the regulations so we, we we're doing with um ICASA, so our transmitting equipment and so on all the right frequencies and so on and then go through the solar civil aviation regulations which are which are quite extensive and um, will take a long time to. Uh, we have to write all our procedures, um, get all our documentation in, in place, um, and eventually go through the process of, of actually doing the application for um, the license to do the to, to do the, the operation. And then eventually, once they give it give it to us, um, will give us the um, then then we can actually start with the life saving blood deliveries, which we are so desperate to try and do. Yes. No, oh, oh, I hope that doesn't take too much longer. <laughs> yes, no, I hope not. We've, 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 we've got our drones. We've got a drone that, mm. that can fly the distance. We can fly 100 kilometers. Um, it can carry a number of units of, of blood in it, and it can bring the samples back. It's a VTOL aircraft. It's a very successful, mm. uh, very reliable uh, German product. Um, and it's a great drone, and we can, we can do it. We can start blood deliveries tomorrow if we if we had the authority to do so but uh, mm. yes getting that authority is going to take a, a considerable number of amount of time uh, looking forward mm. 
It's quite because it's a lot more complicated system than what what my understanding of zipline is, which is just delivery, isn't it? You're you're actually wanting to, as you say, pick up a sample, bring it back, then go back again. You know, you're, you're not just yes. looking at, at simple delivery using a, a, a parachute, or, you know, a, yes. a, a product in a in a box, yeah, so, so to speak. So one of the, the main things normally drones are, are are an a to a type craft so they take off at point a and then they return to point a and their return to home um, position would be would be uh, point a again we're going to be doing an a to b so we we take off at a and we don't land where we took off we land somewhere completely different it may be hmm. let's say 10 kilometers away uh, or 20 kilometers away um so in our case, we need, certainly initially, we will need um, a pilot at each end. Um, so that's quite important. You've got to have a pilot to do the takeoff, a pilot to do the landing. Um, and then uh, the same pilot to do the landing would then load up a new mission onto the drone and do the takeoff. And then the drone would return to where it's uh, originally originated from and do the landing there. So that, yes, is something where we can have, we, have, we will have two pilots at each end. Um, but other than that, and, and, and apart from the fact that it's VTOL, so we don't need uh, a complicated launching system, we don't need a complicated catching or retrieval system to, to catch the drone when it comes back. We can literally take off like a helicopter, transition into a fixed wing aircraft, uh, fly the distance we need to land, and then retransition back to multi-rotor or helicopter type, type and then do the landing, um, and then vice versa on the way home. Um, mm. So yes, zipline drops their blood with a with a parachute. Um, we could potentially do that as well. That is something which is is not. Uh, I mean, it's technically easy enough to do. We could have the VTOL drone. It could hover briefly uh, over the over the um, let's say the clinic, drop the blood, and then uh, retransition back and, and return home again. We don't actually have to land. The landing is yeah. a is an added advantage because we can then do the um, the two L logistics, bringing the bl the blood sample back. But if we, if we just had to deliver blood, that would not be a problem. Um, yeah. You can we can just drop the blood. Um, but the main thing, zipline has uh, the authority to fly areas um, where they are uh, and use routes which people are now used to, and the aviation is used to the drone flying it you know 300 feet um and it uses that specific route every day um and that's what we want to do we're not going to fly um our drones from a clinic of for example from the blood bank to an accident victim on the side of the road and that hmm. may happen in the future but that's not the current plan um we, we we're almost going to have like a scheduled thing so a hospital hmm. has an emergency uh and the route has been pre-planned it has been flown before um, and then the blood will be put into the drone. The drone flies the blood to the hospital and the blood is then taken out. So it's not a new route. It's not something unusual. It's not the first time that week, for example, that the, that, that route will be flown. Uh, it's almost like a scheduled flight. It's just done uh, on demand at, uh, if there's an emergency in the hospital. Well, I hope that comes off because I think that's a re I really like that idea. And I mean, I know people elsewhere have spoken about creating um, airspace for unmanned aircraft, um, mm. you know, to, to get past some of the difficulties. Um, so I hope that does, because you know, as you say, you can stick to certain routes. You're not going to be doing this anyway. So I, I hope that does, yes. if they actually um, like that idea and go with it. Because I think that answers, yes. that would be a great way of keeping it all safe for you, let alone yes. for other people, and as well as from other drone users. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, mm. our, our purpose is, is to deliver blood. We, we, we don't have any need to endanger ourselves, danger the drone, endanger the drone, endanger the public, or do anything like that. We would like to operate in, a, in the safest environment possible. And one of the mm. ways to ensure a safe environment is to segregate the airspace. So that where we are going to be flying, if we have this emergency, that airspace is reserved for our use. And oh. all these segregated airspaces or these areas that we're going to be flying, certainly initially, um, are going to be in rural areas. So we're not going to be flying over uh, heavily built up areas, that, you know, maybe small holdings in some cases, but um, not, not heavily built up areas. 
Um, <laughs> so the risk to the person on the ground or any people on the ground is actually going to be really low. Um, your chance of collision with another aircraft is, 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 should be very, very low, extremely low if we segregate the airspace. Um, hmm. And, um, you know, we're not going to be using the airspace um, above, let's say, 500 foot. We will, we will be flying at 300 feet. We don't need to go higher. Our drone can fly higher, but, but there's no purpose. We need to, because time gets wasted taking off and landing. So the lower we fly, the better it is. So if we mm. can utilize that space below, uh, you know, 300 feet um, and, and have it segregated for us so that micro lights and emergency air ambulances and police and army helicopters don't come into that airspace, that would be great. It's safe for us. It's safe for them. We can get the job done. We can get our blood delivered and we can save lives. And that's, mm. that's really what we want to do. So, um, the sooner we can get our through all these regulatory issues um, and get things like um, hopefully a segregated airspace at some stage, the better it is for us. Oh, wow, well, excellent. Yeah, I, I look forward to hearing news about that. <laughs> yes, I hope, um, hope we'll, have, we'll have some news uh, as, as soon as we can. It's, uh, it, it, it is a process and one's yes. just got to go through it. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, yes, uh, no, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, just sort of drawing to a close, though. Um, if anybody watching, if they wanted to get hold of you, um, how can they do that best? You know, to talk more about your experiences in the bush and equally um, with the blood service. Uh, how can someone get hold of you? Um, well, I'm on. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, so Graham Dyer on LinkedIn. You can search for that, um, or via email as well. Um, okay. I don't give the email address sure well I'll, I'll get it off you and i'll add it onto the, the link that goes okay. with that goes all right with yeah you can, that can contact there. me on my email that's that'll be fine yeah okay great okay well thank you very much graham that was uh that was really interesting um Excellent. So thank thanks. You. thanks louise no no zebra cool. no, no giraffes have come in through the no, window yet i kept looking i was hoping <laughs> 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 an added bonus <laughs> yeah well okay Oh, wow, look at that. Nothing, nothing there today. Uh, they uh, were here earlier, oh, well. but uh, not Next much time. around at the moment. Next time. Next time, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you a photo. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everybody, for, for watching. That was Graham there, um, for, uh, one of the authors for um, Drone Professional One, which is available on Amazon in, in Kindle and paperback format. So um, do look it up. Um, some really interesting insights in there, as you've heard today. Um, thank you for watching again. And as I've said before, but please, in all seriousness, keep yourselves well and keep yourselves safe. Thank you very much.